Ninso ji kan benen do dem mampim chiging don jaba. Nishnabe ke indo de ben dawas. My name is uh, Ojik, and that means the fisher in Ojibwe. My dodem is the rough grouse, and I'm from Chiging First Nation on Manitoulin Island. Me o de Nuki York University, Gebe Kendaso Gamagong, Gebe Kendaso Gamik, Jinka de York, Don Jinuki. I work at York University, and on behalf of the History of Indigenous Peoples Network, and the uh, Shingwalk Residential Schools Centers Center. I'm happy to, uh, uh, that I'm very happy. I'm very happy that Krista accepted my invitation to do this talk about the uh, archives at the Shingwalk Residential Schools. Uh, the reason that I asked that it be actually held earlier than, uh, than the National Truth and Reconciliation Day was that I thought that many people are actually looking for different resources to use, as well as to look at what kind of different programming is actually being held on the actual day. So I thought that if I asked Krista to come here earlier uh, uh, for Mampi um, Mampi Wasmo Sabing, Miigwechtash Kinewea Enchiek, that all of you that have joined on this um, on this call via Zoom, that you would then be armed, or uh, I shouldn't say armed, but that you would actually know where to find a number of different resources, especially at the Shingwak uh, Residential School Center. I first actually came across their archive in and around 2002. And I was uh, quite impressed with uh, the amount of information that they have over there. And I had let, met uh, at that time a fellow named Ed Sadowski, who I think was uh, Krista's predecessor. But I was doing research on residential schools at that time. And I was looking at the um, different newsletters and all the different pictures that they had there. And uh, I was wishing, well, my job at the time with the Ojibwe Culture Foundation was to actually research the residential schools. But in our area, well, Chiging, I should say, were Catholics. So the Catholics actually got sent to Spanish and the Anglicans got sent to Shingwak. So I, I was just impressed with how uh, they, they laid out their information and how they actually set up a program with the children of Shingwak. Uh, they have a program there. But so this is why I'm actually very thankful that Krista actually agreed to do this. And I know I've met Krista a number of years ago and we've talked on and off through the years. So I knew that she would do a, an excellent job today. So without further ado, I, I would uh, turn it over to Krista who actually works at the Shingrock Residential Schools uh, Center up in Sault Ste. Marie, which is affiliated with Algoma University. Okay, miigwech Krista. Thanks so much, Al. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen and then we'll get started. Let me just find the right tab. Okay, there we go. Um, so I want to start off by saying that I'm here as a settler. I'm here as a, a white person who works in a residential school archive that is governed by survivors connected to the Shingwak Residential School. And so a lot of what I'm talking about today um, is really only possible because of the work of generations of survivors and intergenerational survivors. Um, also really want to recognize that I am talking about residential schools and that that can be a difficult topic to hear about, to learn about, and making sure that people take the care that they need, be that individually or as a group, just making sure that we do practice that good self-care and that uh, community care as well. Uh, so we'll hop into it. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how our archives connects to the TRC calls to action to start off. And I think this is beyond just the Shingwak Residential School Center archive, but when we think about archives that house information connecting to residential schools and to colonialism, there's a number of different calls to action that archives connect to. So everything from thinking about call number 57 that's calling for education across all levels of government and public servants, 
um, a lot of the work that the Shingwak Residential School Center does is actually teaching people about the history and legacy of residential schools. And so that I think definitely situates itself within um, that call to action, but also calls to action like 62 and 63 that are really focused on making curriculum that's age appropriate. So thinking about uh, kindergarten through grade 12, learning about residential schools. Uh, since I started at the Shingwak Residential School Center in 2010, a lot of our outreach work has actually focused on local schools and working with teachers to bring educational resources into the school space. Um, there are also calls to action that are specific to archives and museums specifically. And I'll touch a little bit on these throughout kind of the presentation, but thinking about the ways that archives make information accessible, um, working with Indigenous communities and raising awareness about the holdings that archives have connected to residential schools all fall under the calls to action. Archives also have a really vital role to play in ongoing work connected to missing children and burials at residential schools, um, particularly with the site searches happening across Canada and the United States. A lot of the records that are documenting those site searches that are documenting deaths and burials at residential schools are housed in archives. And so there's a really strong connection between community and archives that needs to happen to support that work. Lastly, um, archives can really be involved in commemoration. And I think that has a lot to do with, again, telling the truth about what happened at residential schools and situating it in community and working with community towards um, commemoration that's appropriate to each community. So I'm gonna shift to talk a little bit about the Shingwak Residential School specifically. And much of my talk today is rooted in the history of the Shingwak Residential School and its geographic location in Bawating, which is now known as St. Marie, Ontario. Um, so it was located on the banks of the St. Mary's River and the first Shingwak Residential School, which is the gray black and white photo, uh, opened in 1874. Uh, the school housed approximately 50 children at one time. And in 1900, a girl's wing was added to the school and the school increased to housing about hundred students at one time. That original building was on site until 1935 when the new Shingwak Hall was built. And that's the color photo you see on the screen. And it opened to about 150 students per year. The Shingwak Residential School operated as a residential school until 1970, and it was run by the Anglican Church of Canada. Um, I really want to acknowledge how far children traveled to Shingwak. It wasn't just students from Northern Ontario that attended the Shingwak Residential School. There was many students from Quebec, um, Northern Ontario, like around the James Bay coast, as well as Southern Ontario near Walpole Island. Um, so children traveled from all over when they were sent to the Shingwak Residential School. So though I'm talking about a history that's very tied to Sault Ste. Marie and it's tied to place, it's also its impacts and the ripple impacts extend across Canada and the United States. So it really was the survivor community who recognized the importance of the Shingwak site and make work to make sure that this history wasn't forgotten. In 1979, Dan Pine, pictured here, and other survivors began talking about the importance of honoring the history of Shingwak and bringing survivors together to talk about their experience. Dan Pine advocated for bringing survivors together and repurposing the Shingwak site to become a place of traditional Indigenous education and culture. So it really was the survivor community that did that early work around gathering together. If you had have talked to folks who were at Algoma University, which was then residing in the former Shinglock Residential School building about what the building was, not very many people would have said it was a residential school. It was really only survivors and community members that were carrying that knowledge and were sharing that knowledge widely. In 1981, the first Shingwak reunion was held, and that's what's pictured here. 
And it really was organized as a school reunion. It was organized as a way to bring survivors and families together on the Shinwalk site and to begin to talk about what happened at residential schools. They weren't really sure when they started planning this event who would be organ who would be interested in coming back to a former residential school. They thought, okay, maybe we'll get 50 people out. Over the course of the weekend, they had over 300 survivors participate in events. Um, this is really significant when you think about it, particularly in the 1980s. Uh, there wasn't nationally a conversation happening about residential schools. You still have residential schools open in some places in Canada, and no one was talking about the harms done by residential schools. So this gathering was one of the first of its kind um, that was bringing survivors together to talk about their experiences at residential school. And a few things happened at that gathering. Um, lots of survivors wanted their experiences recorded, both audio and video recorded. There was also people who showed up with like a single photograph or a handful of documents and said, this is what I have about my time in residential school. I want to learn more, but I also want to share with other people. And that's actually how the archive that I work in today was started. It was started as that very grassroots um, bring people together. People recognize there was a need to tell the residential school experience from the perspective of survivors. And that is actually how the archive started, was a way to kind of counter the mainstream narratives about residential schools that were happening in the 80s. Those narratives are mostly coming from the government and the church, not from survivor perspectives. And I think that's actually points to the importance of community archives more broadly. A community archives can be really powerful spaces for talking about identity, for memory, for culture reclamation. In the case of residential school archives, it can also be a really powerful place of healing and reconciliation. And the Shingwak Residential School Center archive is still really driven by survivors of the residential school. Um, so yes, we're housed in Algoma University and it's a partnership between Algoma University and the Children of Shingwak Alumni Association. So that group of survivors that came out of that reunion. Um, but it's the survivors who have the final say. It's the survivors who that, if they tell me I'm doing something wrong, they're the folks that I'm gonna be listening to. And I think that really speaks to thinking about how ongoing work with the Children of Shingwalk Alumni Association proceeds. Um, how the archive is set up is based on the priorities and needs of survivors and intergenerational survivors. And it's constantly adapting and changing based on the needs of those communities. So for example, when the site search of the Shingwalk site started, a lot of our resources shifted to supporting that work. There's also been time periods where we're focused more on education because that's the goal of the survivor organization at that time, um, always centering the needs of survivors and intergenerational survivors. Um, likewise, we operate a little bit differently than a more standard archive very much guided by things like UNDRIP and OCAP. So thinking about ownership, control, access, and possession in the context of survivors and their needs, particularly in the case of residential school records, which were typically created by churches and government organizations and staff at the residential school. Um, we often come into conflict with who intellectually should have rights to that mater material. So if we're thinking about photos in particular, um, those photographs were taken by staff or admin at the residential school. And so under Western law, it would be those people who own the copyright to those materials. Um, but thinking ethically and around Indigenous intellectual property rights, we need to think about the students who are in those photos. Um, they didn't have a choice as to whether or not their photo was taken. 
Many of them didn't have access to cameras in their time in residential school. And those photos have the potential to be really meaningful to themselves and communities and families. And so a lot of the work that we do is trying to connect community with resources that maybe have been extracted from the community in the past. And that really means looking at records on a case-by-case -case basis, asking questions, and listening to survivors. So as I kind of alluded to earlier, the Shinwalk Residential School Center archives really started out with those early conversations that were happening with Dan Pine and the survivor community around starting to bring people together. And I'd say the bulk of the collection actually launched in following that 1981 reunion. The mandate of the Shinwalk Residential School Center is sharing healing and learning in relation to residential schools and reconciliation. And our holdings really range from documents, photographs, artwork, artifacts, and digital media items related to residential schools. When the collection first started, it was really focused on the Shingwalk Residential School specifically. It then expanded to include the Spanish Residential School, which is quite close geographically to the Shingwalk site. Um, but since I'd say the late 90s, early 2000s, we've actually been collecting material related to residential schools all across Canada. And the Shingwalk Residential School Center is one of the largest community archives dedicated to residential schools in the country. And so there's actually over 95 distinct collections that are focused on residential schools, healing and reconciliation. And as I said, they kind of range from across the country. Um, our largest amount of material is Ontario based, though there is a number of collections that are focused on Quebec and uh, some on Western Canada as well. Um, there's two collections that have been recognized by uh, UNESCO and added to the Canada Memory of the World Register, and that's the collections that are documenting the Children of Shingwalk Alumni Association themselves, including the Shingwalk Reunion film. And I think those are those records in particular are really important because they represent the grassroots movement that predates the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the work that survivors have been doing for decades. Um, so the next kind of portion of the presentation, I'm gonna do a little bit of some collection highlights um, to give you some insight into some of the materials that we hold. So I'm gonna start off by talking a little bit about the Shingwalk letter books. So the Residential School Center has a collection of 10 letter books from the first principal and the fourth principal of the Shingwalk Residential School. Where the second and the third ones are, I don't know. I don't know if they didn't exist um, or if they just weren't kept. Um, but these cover the period of 1875 to 1905. So very early residential school history. And there's a lot of different material in these letter books. Um, every, it includes basically all the outgoing correspondence of those two principles. And so that means everything from correspondence with Indian Affairs officials to correspondence with other residential school principals, correspondence with Indian agents in the region, um, to correspondence with teachers and um, in some case, even families. So there's a lot of individuals that are mentioned in the letter books, including lots of information about individual students. Um, so I've included a little snippet on the slide so you can see what the letter books look like. Um, as you can tell, it's all in script. It's all on onion skin paper. These were copy transfers. Um, so it's a little hard to read in some cases. Um, we have digitized all of it. We received a grant to do that. And we're currently working on transcribing the letter books so that it's easier for people who are looking for family to be able to just keyword search their family name. Um, right now, if people reach out to us, we kind of do a little bit of digging through the letter books on our own to try and point them in the right direction. 
my colleague Jenna LeMay uh, worked on this project and created a really good kind of index for them. So that is available to researchers who are interested in using it. Um, so as I mentioned, the letter books also uh, include kind of a lot of contextual historical information. Um, in this case, um, one of the examples that comes to mind is the Northwest Rebellion or the Northwest Resistance is mentioned in a number of letters and provides kind of historical context on what was happening in Northern Ontario at that point. Um, it also speaks to the kind of state of Anglican missionary work in the early, late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, And I think one of the most important pieces about this letter book project is actually how we've gone about describing the letter books. And so one of the things that we did is really work closely with the survivor community, um, recognizing that these letter books do contain information about students. We want to make sure that survivors were really involved in discussing how they wanted to highlight what were in the letter books, what was important to them and what might people want to know about the letter books. Um, so we worked kind of collaboratively to develop descriptions for the letter books, um, including like descriptions for names of communities in the region, names in the language that could be used, um, and wanting to ensure that subject tags that we were using um, not weren't prioritizing Western perspectives or Western concepts of language. Um, there are some letters that are in Anishinaabe Moan that are included in the letter book. Um, the first principal of the Shinwalk Residential School uh, created an Anishinaabe Moan dictionary at one point. So it's using his dictionary to kind of do those letters. So some speakers have looked at them and said, that's not how we would have spoken the language. Um, it's a very a, a wide interpretation of the language. Um, but that's kind of a high level overview of that particular collection. I think they are really useful for looking at the early history of residential schools in Canada. I know um, we've had some colleagues uh, from the Mohawk Institute look at these records as well as people who are interested in the Carlisle residential school because there's mentions of both of those in the letter books. So the other collection that I wanted to point to is the Aboriginal Healing Foundation Library and Archives. So the Aboriginal Healing Foundation operated for around 16 years with an emphasis on healing and reconciliation work driven by community. So they had a funding model where they distributed funding to community groups all across the country to fund community driven healing initiatives. And we are the repository for the AHF library as well as the, their archives. So that includes any of the outputs that came from those community driven projects, but it inc also includes all the original research that was done by the Aboriginal Healing Foundation during its 16 year mandate. Um, so it's quite a unique resource. I'd say it's actually probably one of the most underutilized resources we have in the center. It hasn't been well advertised to date, um, but for folks who are looking at community healing um, and also reckon early forms of reconciliation, I think this is a really great resource. The other kind of piece that I think is one of the most important in the Shangwak Residential School Center archives is the oral history and survivor testimonies that we hold. Um, particularly, as I mentioned, the 1981 reunion, a lot of oral histories were recorded at that time with testimony. Um, they were also recorded again in 1991. And I think having those early testimonies is incredibly important. A lot of people's perspectives changed over the years about residential schools. Even in the case of the two reunions, there's some individuals who are recorded at both reunions and how they talk about residential schools substantially changes in the 10 years. Um, and this is way before we're getting into national conversations about residential schools. 
Um, we also have a newer collection of interviews that uh, was started in about 2020. Um, it's called Shing Walk and Beyond, and it's focused on both survivors and intergenerational survivors of Shing Walk, um, really with an emphasis on trying to talk about both Shing Walk experiences, but life experiences more broadly, recognizing that often residential school uh, testimony is focused on a very tiny portion of someone's life. But the impacts of residential school are much greater than just the time someone was at residential school. Um, likewise, there's a lot of survivors who went on to do really amazing things after they left residential school and wanting to give opportunities for people to be able to talk about that. Um, so I'm going to shift to talk a little bit about the project Al alluded to at the beginning, and that's the Remember the Children project. And so this is one of the longest running programs offered by the Shingwak Residential School Center. And it really focuses on connecting survivors and communities to residential school photographs. It provides free copies of archival photographs to communities and survivors, and also encourages participants to identify people, places, and activities in the photos. Um, this pilot project, or when it was a pilot project, it started in 2004 and it focused on the residential school in Spanish Ontario. And the project initially spurred out of a donation of photographs that was over 5,000 images from the Spanish residential schools, but none of those images had students identified in them. And so working with the Children of Shenwalk Alumni Association, um, they worked to bring photos into community through creating reproduction photo albums and so visited communities along the North Shore of Lake Huron, where many of those um, students who attended Spanish were from. And throughout the course of the pilot project, um, they actually ended up with about a 40% identification rate of people in the photos. So adding a lot of names and a lot of context to those albums. Um, and at the end of that pilot project, reproduction photo albums were gifted to community libraries, wellness centers, and band offices to make sure that communities had that resource. Um, I'd say the act of adding names to archival photographs, it sounds relatively small, but it can actually have a really profound impact on individuals, families, and communities that have been directly impacted by residential schools. The act of naming really begins the process of individualizing the historical record and eliminating that erasure that happened through archival and government approaches to record keeping. Identifying people in residential school images can also start conversations about healing in families. It also allows researchers to connect um, survivor testimony to actual photographs. Um, I would note that this work with community isn't necessarily easy. There's lots of people who still don't want to talk about residential schools, and that's totally okay. Um, it's this identification has also become increasingly harder as many survivors age and survivors pass on. Um, and so this process, I think, is still really crucial to do while there are living survivors who have memory of what happened at residential schools. Um, there's an example on the screen here. This is actually an example from Shinglock. Oh no, it's from News Factory, sorry, my mistake. Um, so this is a photo that uh, we didn't know any of the names in the image. And we ended up, we shared it on our Facebook page. That's kind of the new iteration of this project is sharing digitally as well as in person. Um, but the conversations that happened in this Facebook post were uh, kind of funny and kind of very much uh, seeing community connecting with each other. Um, as you can see, we now have a lot of the names of everybody that's in the photograph. Um, there was also some light teasing that happened between some of the girls and the boys that were in the photograph saying, I remember pinning you during this judo club and uh, just cousin back and forth, like rivalries and things like that. So it was nice not just to get the names, but also to see that community dialogue that was happening. So beyond the 
archival collections in the Shanghua Presidential School Center. Um, a lot of the work that we've been doing in recent years is connected to the Reclaiming Shanghua Call project. And so it is a ongoing education and exhibition program that is really dedicated to telling the history of the Shanghua Residential School on the site and um, to also contextualizing that history in the larger history of colonialism. So the photo here is from the Life at Shingwak Gallery. You can kind of see by the photo that it's in a hallway. Um, and so Algoma University is located in the former Shingwak Hall building. It's a functioning university building. Um, but I think it's really important that there is information about the Shingwak site in that building today. It used to be not uncommon that students would come to Algoma University and not realize they were studying in a former residential school. Um, whereas today, it's really apparent when you're walking through the halls that this was a residential school, that this site has significance and really making an active effort to teach people about this history. Um, so the Reclaiming Shingwa Call project, it opened uh, to the public in 2018. Uh, the first phase of it had three gallery spaces. So the Life at Shingwok space, um, We Are All Children of Shingwok, which is really honoring residential school survivors. And then uh, from Teaching Wigwam to Residential School, which is more contextualizing residential schools in the larger history um, of the region. Um, in 2019, a second phase of that project opened. And it's very much telling the life at Shingwok story, but it's doing so through artifacts and objects. So a much more kind of tactile feel, recognizing that the exhibit in the hallway is pretty text and image heavy and wanting people to be able to learn in different modes. Um, the final phase of the project, I'm hoping will open before the end of this year. It's had a lot of COVID delays. Um, but it's going to be contextualizing residential schools in the broader history of colonialism with kind of an art focus. Um, yeah, so I'm excited to see that happening as well. Um, this panel here is actually um, my favorite panel in the exhibit. It's called Missing Evidence, and it's actually talking about all the photos on the wall and how um, just because you're seeing photographs of students smiling, just because you're seeing photographs of students looking happy, quote unquote, doesn't mean that actually was the case. Recognizing that photos don't tell everything. Um, they don't tell the entire story. And there's a lot of interpretation that needs to be done to understand residential school photos in context. Um, and I think that's really where that work comes back to centering survivor voices. Um, and so thinking about ways that survivors' voices can be included in everything the Shingwok Residential School Center does, including its outreach programming. Um, and some of the questions we've really grappled with are around things like, how do you include the voices and experiences of survivors who have passed on? Um, for example, how do you talk about the history in the early 1800s, late 1800s? Um, and so when I talked about the letter books, that's one example where there's actually students named from those time periods. And they talk very specifically about some students, say, working in the carpentry shop, some students working in the boot making shop and naming those students. And so one of the things that we started to do is include those names in the narratives that we're sharing. So it's not just blanket students, but naming individuals because people connect to those individuals and to family lines as well. Um, one of the other pieces that is kind of an ongoing negotiation is thinking about truth telling versus wanting to care for survivors and making sure people aren't being triggered in spaces. And so I actually included this photo because it's one of the photos that ultimately ended up in the exhibit, but there was a lot of conversation about whether or not it was okay to include this image. 
And part of that conversation was because the dormitories were not a safe space for many people at residential school. Um, but working with the Children of Shingwak Alumni Association, a lot of them pointed to the fact that people need to know the truth about what happened at residential schools. And a lot of people don't realize what those dormitory spaces actually looked like, how close the beds were to each other, how little privacy there was and things like that. So the decision from the survivor community that I work with was that that image would be included. And I think that kind of points to the fact that every decision, major decision through the center goes through that survivor body. And I think that's something really unique as an archive and the center itself. So I'm gonna do a little bit of a circle back here to think about, again, the Shingwak Residential School Center and um, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and thinking about the ways in which the Shingwak Residential School Center is really guided by survivors, which I think is key. Um, you also see that in, for example, our work with uh, on-site tours. We also have a virtual tour um, that allows people who can't physically come to Sault Ste. Marie, they can participate in. Um, but that virtual tour is very much informed by work with the survivor community. And more than that, um, a lot of the work that we do is driven to support survivors and intergenerational survivors. And so that means maybe, you know, I'm in my office at work, a survivor comes in and is just looking for photos, heard we have photos and wants help. Uh, finding themselves or finding a relative. That means that I drop whatever I'm doing. I drop the meeting, I drop um, the spreadsheet that I'm working on and I go and help that survivor. And I think that's a really big difference than how a lot of archives work. A lot of archives are very structured in terms of how um, people have to approach them, how they have to schedule time there, their opening hours and things like that. Whereas we're much more informal and geared towards community researchers. We do get academic researchers as well and are always happy to help them, um, but wanting to make the space friendly for people who maybe don't have knowledge as to what an archive is. Um, next, thinking about how education is really informed by our holdings in the residential school center. Um, so a lot of our education work is really tied to place, it's tied to the Shingwak Residential School, it's teaching about what happened on the site, but that's all informed through survivor testimony and also through talking about records or pulling records so that people can see, yes, this happened. Sometimes that's what people need in order to be able to learn that history. Um, lastly, thinking about how archives connect to healing. And as I mentioned, like that finding a photo, um, starting conversations with family, I think all of that is really connected into the archive. And that's what makes archives so powerful in some ways is its potential to relate to people on many different levels. Um, so I think I'm kind of gonna leave it there. And then if we wanna have a chat or, um, answer questions, I'd be happy to do that. So I'll just stop my screen share and we can go from there. All right, to me, Gwetcha, Krista. I, uh, I knew some of that, of course, um, but just by visiting the site a number of different times, going to do talks at the uh, at uh, Algoma or just visiting. And then also the research that I was trying to do on uh, a couple of fellows who ended up becoming literate. And uh, one wrote the manuscript, another moved back to his community and became the uh, secretary, council secretary. Uh, and then he wrote a number of uh, stories down at that are in the uh, National Archives of Canada. So you mentioned that there's a uh, virtual tours but I was wondering if there's actually an online exhibit that people can prove. Yeah. 
Um, so there actually isn't an online exhibit as of yet. I would like to see the Reclaiming Shinhua call um, be online. It, we aren't there yet, I'm trying to focus on getting the on-site one completed. Um, the virtual tour does include the exhibit space though, so people can look through the exhibit in the virtual tour. So that virtual tour then just has a link. Uh, I guess we you could put that in the chat. The your link to your um, yeah. So we're yeah. actually just working on finalizing the permit okay. for it. Um, right now, if people want to book a virtual tour, they can email us and we can arrange for that. I'll put the general email for the center in the chat though. Um, I did also get a question around if uh, this was being recorded and shared. It is being recorded. Um, we'll likely post it on the SRSC Facebook page just so people have access to it that way. The the other question I had is, uh, like I was saying, I worked uh, at the Ojibwe Culture Foundation and uh, I moved back to the reserve here in 99. And then I got hired. That's when that Aboriginal Healing Foundation was starting up. And then I was supposed to do, well, I did do an exhibit. Uh, and it was the the concept was healing through the arts. Anyway, that's what the OC, Ojibwe Culture Foundation also has these, uh, some of these photos from the Spanish residential school. But we were trying the same thing to have people come in and name and name the uh, people in there. And I think he said there was like 3,000 that that uh, he's currently hold. But I wondered if uh, when we were at the OCF, I, I tried to get the these kind of standardized in the sense that now here's who's named in this picture or that picture. But I don't think that that actually, when I saw those binders at the band office later in subsequent years and at different uh, band offices, I wonder if all those out photo albums and when, when they've been named, have actually been, the people have been named in a central kind of um, archive, like I have those names. Yeah, at, yeah at, so that's at, one of the challenges with that project yeah. that um, I don't know that has ever been addressed adequately because often uh, these albums go into community and then they take on their own life. Yeah. Uh, we do try and reconnect to try and get names back, but it isn't always successful. So there might be a photo in Chiging, for example, that has a name on it, but we don't necessarily have the name at the okay. residential school center. We try, but I think there's definite gaps. It is that was a massive, uh, like there's so many communities. Those things, those books went out to, those photo albums went out to, and I just thought it's going to be a massive undertaking to bring that all back in, and then to actually start to say, okay, this picture in each of these albums, let's say, ten of the twenty, name uh, this person as being whoever and then there's a couple of variations so yeah I think yeah spelling variation is one that comes up a lot too because yeah. we're really reliant on community members to do identifying and so okay. we've got the language variation from region to region um that sometimes comes into that description one of the things that started um after i started at the residential school center was we worked to link back those photo albums to the original archival record. For a long time, the um, photo albums were kind of a standalone project and they didn't yeah. connect back to the archival record. Whereas now when we get new names, we update the archives as well. So there is at least some consistency there as much as we can. There's a question in the chat. Yeah, um, so the question, I'll just read it. Are there collections or font at the Ogomi University Archives, not part of the SRSC, but relevant to Indian residential schools? So that's a good question. Um, so the Algoma University Archives actually holds the Anglican Diocese of Algoma <coughs> Archives. And so that includes all the records created by the Anglican Church from about Muskoka up to Thunder Bay. And the, since the Anglican Church operated the Shinglock Residential School, there's definitely records in there that are connected to residential schools, as well as some day school records as well. Um, I would say we've got a good working relationship. I'm also the diocesan archivist, so I kind of wear a couple hats. Um, so overseeing both of those repositories, we share pretty well between each of them. <laughs> 
The other question that I had was um, of the 1981 and 1991 uh, recorded uh, testimonies. Would you how, are you able to give a figure of how many actually testimonies were given in Ojibwe? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know if there's any in Ojibwe, to be honest. Okay. I think they're all in English. Yeah. There's a couple, I think, videos that maybe aren't full interviews where there is some Ojibwe spoken, but not very much. Okay. Yeah. If other folks have questions, feel free to unmute or uh, put it in the chat. Yeah, so who does the transcribing? Um, so for the letter books, we've been working with a combination of a couple volunteers, as well as uh, work study students and uh, interns through a like archives employment uh, program. Uh, so it's kind of been a combination. It's It's been a long process so far, and we're still not done. Each letter book ranges from about 800 to 1,000 pages. Um, and as you kind of saw on the screen, it can be mm -hmm. a little difficult to read at times. So we're working through the transcription, but it, it's an ongoing process. I was wondering as well, you mentioned that uh, from 1981 to 1991, some of the um, testimonies uh, uh, that the survivors had given 10 years apart it kind of the tone changed or they they revealed more i wondered if you had actually or any any of your predecessors have uh, written about that and uh, and published it yeah I, not that i'm aware of actually um i do think it's really interesting um the tone of those two gatherings and how they changed you even see it in how the public speeches went for those two events yeah um so there was like an opening ceremony for both events that had included survivors as well as local dignitaries talking about what happened at residential school but also just welcoming people um the tone of the 1981 was much more celebratory at 1991 reunion, you have survivors talking about the horrible things that happened at residential school. That's actually then also where you see residential school denialism starting to happen from some of the staff who was at the 1991 reunion. Okay. Um, the opening to uh, J.R. Miller's Shingwak's vision actually takes place at the 1991 Shingwak reunion. He's talking about a staff member saying like nothing bad happened at the residential school, which we know wasn't the case. The, the other question that I had um, about that, and you like um, you mentioned this that now you now current students at Algoma actually know they are at a residential school. And I, I forget when you said how long you've started there, but have you noticed a, a shift or uh, any kind of um, perspectives on current students? Uh, in the time you've been there, students that have enrolled are non-Indigenous and non-Indigenous, and uh, their what their realization of actually being in a residential school, how has that uh, actually uh, been um, demonstrated by by their either behavior or their uh, um, or what have you? That uh, yeah. So I'd say when I first started back in 2010 at the residential school center very much it was more um certain classes would learn about the history of the Shanglock right. site and it was really up to the faculty member to do that reach out to the center and then maybe bring us in for a talk whereas now um it's much more embedded through things like orientation um as well as just onboarding of new staff and so there's more awareness i think broadly about residential schools um, I think you're also seeing more participation in things like Orange Shirt Day and the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation from the student body and genuine engagement when there are events on campus. Um, folks are turning up and wanting to be engaged with uh, activities that are happening. Mm 
That was actually, well, I, I shouldn't say the first, but it was really early when uh, when I went and did a, I was taken on a tour at Shingwalk, and then that was one of the first places where I had seen that there was an actual graveyard. And then uh, later on, I went to Spanish and I read of it. And then I didn't know because I went to Spanish, um, the, the site. Uh, and of course, it was just uh, the two buildings were still standing at that point, but they weren't manned. And nobody was there. And it was just I just went up on my own. So I didn't know that there was a graveyard there, too. And then subsequently, we uh, a fellow uh, by the name of Bill Lonk, who's actually a, a Jesuit, wrote about the uh, about the graves there and this was of course before before this i forget when he published that book of, of the names of people who of the children who passed away there so this was like 10, at least 10 to 15 years ago when uh when bill launch reported that but also of course before then was when I, I went on that tour there so it's uh it i was in a sense i was surprised that people were surprised that there were uh, graves this uh, at the residential schools because I knew these two actually had great unmarked graves and they had graves there and uh, so I, I was just wondering have you since the 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 national discovery or it making the national news in a sense whereas this kind of was known I would I would think that uh, a lot of Anishinaabek knew of this uh, of these graves and I don't know if many regional non-natives knew of this but it, it kind of took me back i thought oh i thought everyone knew there was graves there kind of thing but yeah. and it just seemed like uh anyway go go ahead no i would completely agree and i think that's something working with both indigenous and non-indigenous people um anishinaabe and anishinaabe are very much they knew have known this for years whereas non-indigenous people might just be learning for the first time when it hit the media um, yeah. Even in Sault Ste. Marie, there was lots of people who maybe had never walked not that far away from the main building to see the cemetery there. Right. So, yeah, that was, uh, and uh, I, I just, I just knew that um, over there at Shingwak, you were doing a lot of good, good work with, and kind of ahead of, ahead of the rest, it seemed, seemed to me anyway, ahead of the rest of, um, of the of the of Canada and actually kind of a, trying to address healing and trying to address the truth and of course nobody was talking about reconciliation back then yeah so now it, it, I guess uh, talking when you're when you're talking to survivors there because you you have a lot of uh, interaction with them uh, and that seeing that in 2010 you've been involved uh, is that word like because you posted up there the Aboriginal Healing Foundation uh, and that it was a, a program for 16 years I think it was anyway was that of course it isn't enough this is almost a leading question there wasn't enough time for healing before you could actually get to reconciliation but can you tell us a bit about what the, the perspectives or what if, if you feel comfortable about what the survivors are actually saying about the word, the change, the change in discourse about residential schools from the Aboriginal Healing Foundation, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and then, you know, what kind of, uh, kind of yeah. those. I think that's a really good question. And I think it also depends on who you talk to. There's a lot of survivors who have varying opinions around reconciliation itself, also around healing itself. Um, I think reconciliation, one of the phrases that a lot of the CSA repeat is that the truth needs to come before reconciliation. And in many cases, people are still at the truth hearing phase and needing to do that in order for reconciliation to happen. But I think there's also, if we're thinking about the shift from healing to reconciliation, one was very survivor focused and reconciliation is more relationship focused. Right, and right. So there's a de-emphasis in some cases that isn't yeah. ideal. Right. The other thing, I don't know if any of your students that have visited the, the archives, your collections, uh, again, if anybody has visited and then like have some of the same ones, kind of assuming that they're still alive, 
that in uh, 81, 91, and then actually gave testimony to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And then if that, yeah. yeah, okay. That was uh, one of the things as well. One of my buddies had said to me, this was actually during the Aboriginal Healing Foundation, after the Healing Foundation went. And uh, he, uh, he uh, just just regarding uh, discourse and how things are, are talked about. And he mentioned the um, in his uh, that he he taught a class, and he mentioned that uh, the Basil Johnson's book there, Indian School Days, and he said that um, he asked his students, "Do you think that this book would get published as it is today, based on how things are talked about?" And it sounded kind of like uh, unlikely, but. Uh, Anyway, it was just an interesting, uh, I thought it was an interesting question, just how we talk about these things and how things uh, things would change. Yeah, I completely agree. Okay. Well, I see people are starting to um, sign yeah, up. Two o'clock, so yeah. thank you again, Al, for inviting me. And okay. I did pop that email in the chat. Um, so if anybody has further questions or wants to reach out around the resources held by the Residential School Center, please feel free to get in touch. Okay, Krista, this was this was great.